Okay, so we've just gone two o'clock. I've got a lot to try to cover in the next two hours, so I'm going to get going. Uh, anyway, at Stragglers, there's plenty of room for people to come in and sit down anyway. So just to make sure everyone thinks they're in the right session, the session is C++ 17, the next C++ standard in breadth and not depth. So the idea by the end of this session is you will know absolutely everything that has gone in or changed with C++ 17, and know may maybe not a whole lot about any of it, but you've got a good idea about what you want to go and see during the rest of the week if anyone's talking about any of these topics. And hopefully you'll have a, a fair idea of what to do with these things, but certainly not an in-depth on any particular topic. And for those of you who don't know me, my name is Alistair Meredith. Uh, I currently work for Bloomberg as one of their senior developers on their own internal standard library, and we publish that now through um, the open source BDE project. Uh, during the evolution of C++ 14, I was a library working group chair, so I know a little bit about what went into all that we're about to see. So I'm going to have a quick slide just for who's aware of how the C++ standards process works in practice. So just a Fair show of hands. Quick bit of background, uh, one slide's worth and no more. Um, why do we have a C++ standard in the first place? This predates me, going back to about 1990. Um, there was a, a wide variety of dialects of C++ emerging as everyone liked following up on Bjarne's work and adding their own different extensions. So it would be really good to have a, a talking shop where people could come together and produce a consistent dialect and version of that language. But that hits anti-cartel legislation in the States, that lots of companies colluding actually are seen as a bad thing. Whereas if you convene under an ISO standards process, it's an open process, everyone can come and participate. So that was the way to go ahead and we actually set about creating a C++ standard that eventually fooled the committee that they actually had to publish something. But that turned out to be quite a good thing for us. If you want to follow what these standards group are working on. Uh, if you Google WG21, that's the name of our standards group under the ISO process, or the last part of our name, it's quite a long acronym. And um, the other place we can go and follow standards work now is the isocpp.org website, which is intended to be a new community, well, new, it was new a while back, hopefully everyone here will know about it because this is one of the outreaches as a consequence of creating this website and this organization. This is intended to be the online home and community for C++ at large. So quick history of the C++ standards. 1998, we had the first standard, and that took roughly seven years and 21 meetings. Then we had the 2003 standard, that was five years later. Um, your spot, we significantly slowed down the amount of work we were doing at that period, and that might have set some false expectations about how the standards process is supposed to work. This was because we had a false understanding of how the standards process is supposed to work. We thought that once you publish a standard, you weren't allowed to touch it for five years. So we did five years of defect reports, fixing things, and then found out that no, after five years, you have to say we're retaining the standard or, do, or it retires, and we should have been doing new work all that time. So 2003 is roughly also when I joined the process. And for the next eight years, we started working on C++ 07, eight, nine, it escaped in 2011. Um, roughly, as you can see, a similar amount of time that went into the original standard, and I hope you all agree that it was a big step forward in what you could do with C++, the idioms you could use, and how the language would interact with the broader software community. Um, following to, to 2011 standard, we wanted to start work clear, clearly on the next standard, and we did not want to have another Big Bang release taking another 10 years. So the idea was we were going to have a new standard around about 2017 and started work on that. And around about 2014, we already had a lot of bug reports and defects we wanted to fix. So rather than say, going through the standards process, you can't add new features in something like a bug fix technical corrigendum, which was the 2003 standard. So just to avoid asking that questions, we said 2014, we'll call it a new standard, it will simplify our paperwork. And at that last meeting, everyone dropped in any new feature that happened to be ready, so 2014 was actually a, a better iteration than we were expecting. 2017, another three years later, similar amount of time, should be where we'd be landing hopefully substantially more features. 
So if you're looking at the evolution from 2011 to 2014 to set your expectation for how much of an increment we have now, hopefully you're going to be um, pleasantly surprised. So where are we in the C++17 process? Uh, final slide on process, sorry. I've uh, put this one together at the last minute. Uh, we're currently in C++17 ballot review. That means that the start of, at the end of June, start of July, we sent out what we would hope to be the C++17 candidate document for the new standard. That's gone to ISO for ballot. We have roughly up until sometime in the middle of October to send ballot comments back to ISO to address any issues and defects we think we spot in that standard, but no new features should be added at this point. Um, we expect, with our experience of previous standards, that we'll have another two standards meetings that will process and deal with those defect reports, which means roughly the end of, uh, first week of March is our second meeting. We should be sending that back to ISO, hopefully as our final approved standard. They will ballot that for a, a few months, say in the middle of summer. If that all goes according, according to plan, we should have a new standard published sometime by the end of the year. So that's where we are in the process. It does mean everything I'm about to show you is subject to change. We've got this ballot resolution, but is substantially factually correct. Um, while we've been working on C++17, just a quick slide, we've been working on a whole bunch of other things. The ones in green we worked on well enough and early enough that we've actually landed those in the new standard. Those will be part of C++17. The yellow TSs are additional projects we've worked on. We've published them as experimental material and hopefully those will all be part of C++20. And the ones in white are our ongoing projects that we're still working on publishing. So even though we're publishing C++17, there's still a lot of existing ongoing work happening in parallel. The committee is very busy these days. Um, again, just trying to set expectations as to the growth of the standard. I just, page count's not necessarily a good guide, but it gives you again an indication that if you look around about 2011, we had a big dump of new things coming into the standard. Um, a new 100 pages in the core and a huge growth in the library. So C++11, people like to talk about the changes in the language, but you can see in terms of the standard, it was a huge addition to the library. And it's a similar kind of thing happening again in 2017. You can see we're adding a reasonable number of pages to the core language as we clean up and add lots of features, smaller features. The library's taken another reasonable size change, but also it's not on the same scale as C++11. And if you're wondering why there's a small page count reduction in the 2014 core language, we didn't take things out, we just used a slightly smaller font in the standard. So <laughs> those 2017 pages are far more valuable. And again, just showing again the evolution of the standard. Around about two, the first standard, it was a fairly even balance between core and library in terms of volume of what went into the standard. But there's been a real desire to expand within the library and just provide the core language features that will allow us to write richer libraries. So you can see that for 2017, this will be the first standard where the library is actually more than twice the size of the core language. So what have we done with C++17? 17 at a glance. Um, it builds on C++14, which we published two years ago. As I say, it's a significant library update. You saw from the previous page count, we're adding almost 200 pages to the library. And most of that's coming through libraries that we've already trialed in existing technical specifications. So they're coming already in good shape, well tested. Um, on the language side, it's a modest change, but in total, you can see roughly we've got, we've accepted close to 120 proposals. So I've got a lot to talk about in 120 minutes. Um, some of those pro proposals are reasonably large in scope. Some of them are very small, just maybe changing a word or two, but it all adds up to the feature set we're going to look at. As I said, mostly we're landing a lot of the existing technical specification work. An ongoing thing that happens every release of the standard, we get a lot of clean up, clean up of the existing wording and presentation. So the standard's a lot more precise about as issues come in and people start playing with corner cases, we find where the vague things are. Uh, the standard's a specification, not a library, or a compiler specifically. So fixing the specification is a slightly more interesting and entertaining involved process, but we keep, continue to clean up and give a much better contract between the customer and the developer. And on the language side, 
as I said, I don't think I'm seeing any significant new idioms. If you look back at C++11, the big things where we had move semantics, we had a well-defined memory model, we had lambdas coming in. It was quite a, a series of things that would fundamentally change the way you might program. In C++17, we have a lot of things that make a lot of those idioms that we've been introducing over the years much easier to use, but don't go looking for the big new idiom. That's more like with C++20. For those of you who have been following the process and wondering where are these things, these are some of the big ticket items people were hoping to land. Concepts, we've got it out of, published as a TS, but it was just a little too late in terms of getting experience to be landing it directly into C++17. Um, if this doesn't land in C++20, there's a lot of people going to be very disappointed. If you don't know what concepts are, come back in three years. You'll be hearing an awful lot about them if you haven't heard already. Coroutines was another one that came in very well-defined shape because Microsoft have been shipping their implementation of this language feature, and they've given us a specification that, was, that looked pretty much good enough to accept. The main reason it didn't land is there's another idea of coroutines happening out the networking development side. So we've got competing ideas in the space. So Microsoft, you know, happily gave us this, this work and said, okay, well, we'll publish it as a technical specification so we can carry on honing the standards process. And this will be, again, ready to land very quickly in C++20, depending upon how the competing proposal goes. So active work on coroutines, but nothing landing in 17. So with that, let's get talking about what actually is going in 17. Quick color code for trying to decode my slides as I go through fairly quickly. Something in green is something that landed in C++14 or earlier. A quick show of hands, who followed what happened with C, is aware of the differences between C++14 and C++11? Just so I've got a sense of the audience. Okay, I've got a well-informed audience, that's good. Most of the green stuff is I was adding the C++14 as a, as a gradual migration, but you're already ahead of me on that. Anything in yellow is part of the C++17 candidate CD. Things in this funny purpley color, they were supposed to have landed in the CD, but due to a couple of last minute editorial problems, didn't actually land in. So we still expect those to be part of the published standard, but if you look at the one we sent out for ballot, you'll not see those yet. And then I'm using this funny orange color to say here's something that was deprecated, discouraged, removed. So kind of, this is the bad thing color. So first things we did, starting with the simplest and working our way up the scale towards some of the more interesting features. Uh, our binding to other standards. The C++ standard has to ref refer to other standards for some parts of its specification. So we have the C, li C standard, specifically the C standard library, that we have not updated for a while. So I think C++11 finally bound to the C99 standard just as C was publishing the C11 standard. So having a good update to our library to get back in sync again with the C standard library. Uh, we're adding a new binding to the ISO 80000 specification, which uh, this used to be ISO 31, which is about the oldest standard we could find to bind against. This specifies some mathematical special functions. So anyone who was following the uh, TR1 process back in the day, that's your heads up for what might be coming in the library this afternoon. We also have a binding to POSIX and to the Unicode standard and to the ECMAScript standard, because that's where we specify our regular expressions libraries. And those are in orange, because I noticed when we now we're filing our ballot comments, all of those are currently binding to older, out-of-date standards. So hopefully those will all be updated in the next two months, next um, two meetings. So we're rebasing on the C11 library. What does that mean? Well, clearly we're going to update the reference of which library we're bringing in by specification. Um, part of the presentation, as I said, we've improved the quality of the specification itself. One of the awkward things with the C standard library functions and structures was we just said, look at that other document, and we didn't show you what the headers looked like. So it was kind of tricky piecing together what, was, what, what the C parts of the C++ standard library looked like. So we've actually expanded all those headers in line to say this is how you apply the mapping for what the C standard library headers look like in C++. Uh, we actually make it easy to find in the index as well. There's been a fair bit of work on the index if you are a, a, a standards geek who actually likes to read the standard itself. And naturally fixing up all the cross-references so you don't have out-of-date references pointing to the wrong words in the other document. Uh, 
one of the questions we had when looking at the C standard library is in C11, they introduced the notion of optional components of a standard, which C++ doesn't really have. And one of the larger optional components is Annex K, which is the, the safe or the checked standard library API, which was uh, some work that said all those places where you provide a pointer and then there's no real way to check whether or not the library was given the right range or not, so you can have buffer overflows running off the end too easily. There's now an underscore S um, parallel, or surrogate version of that library that will give you the ability to check, the library the ability to check the parameters as they come in. And that's an optional part of the C standard library. We're not importing that into the C standard version of that same library in the, in the standard namespace. And it's therefore implementation defined, so if your vendor ships that in the global namespace as part of C, they can do so, but they, they just tell you whether or not they've done that. We're deprecating some C++ 14 headers. So those that map to the funny C language features of how they deal with complex numbers, some of their generic math functions or macros. Uh, these don't really do anything useful in C++. They're effectively vacuous headers. So we're just deprecating them. They can just follow the pattern of why we introduced them. And likewise, when it came to dealing with the memory model stuff, the way C has, C++ has slightly diverged, C is doing this directly in terms of some keywords. We didn't import those headers when we imported the rest of C11. So that is probably some fairly useful information to be aware of. Moving on. Um, Vocabulary is an important thing when you're talking about standards and things coming out of the standard. Um, they we're getting a wide, um, some confusion out of some of these terms and lots of competing terms for the same thing, that people would talk about the same thing not realizing they were talking about the same thing. So we've got a few new standard terms in the standard itself. The first one is forwarding references, because we had this wonderful chap called Scott Myers trying to make sense of the R value reference syntax in C++11 Finally decoded the rules that he, he decided meant universal references. And then we have the rules for almost universal references and why universal references aren't quite universal. And the main issue comes down to when you're in a template deduction context, if I've got the double ampersand, I'm going to do a deduction as to what that type T is, and it's typically going to deduce to an L value or an R value reference, as opposed to distinctly type T. Or if it's true, if it deduces T, I have an R value reference, but if I've got, if I'm deducing off an L value, it will deduce T as an L value reference. So rather than getting confused with the talk of R values and L values, in this syntax, it's actually doing something following those rules, but with a different effect when you step back and think about how you're using it. We're now consistently calling those forwarding references and suggest that's the vocabulary that the community should use now as well. Certainly that's what the, how the standard is going to refer to this idiom in the future. Uh, another thing that uh, was running around with far too many different names was now we can initialize data members in, directly in a class and therefore if you don't initialize it in the constructor, that's, a, that's the initialization it's going to perform. And there were a variety of names for this running around including the, the wonderful NSDMI acronym, uh, which I think was non-static data member initialization. So. The name we've chosen for this, just to simplify and have everyone talking about the same thing in the same way are default member initializers. And finally, these funny things that show up in templates that aren't quite templates, but follow a lot of the rules of templates for dependent values and types and so forth. We've got a template, a member of a class template, uh, a template member of a non-class, non-templated class, and these things that kind of look like templates should follow the template rules. Uh, we just call them all templated entities rather than spit out this big long list of special case rules all over the place. So hopefully that will allow us to talk more precisely and more simply about some corners of, of the use of templates in the future. On the library side, we're introducing the term of contiguous iterators, which are almost a new iterator category. That a refinement of the idea of a random access iterator that goes one step further and says, if I take the address of the element I'm referring to and take the address of something that's further on down the, the same sequence, I can do simple pointer arithmetic and it's going to work. Because you could easily have some kind of clever iterator that's doing some bookkeeping between each element. So although I can do all the random access behavior, I still can't do the pointer arithmetic. 
and we want to guarantee in certain circumstances, classically array, basic, string, and vector, that those iterators really do have the, the contiguity guarantee. So it's not quite a new iterator category because it doesn't have a tag yet. And we're still looking at that in the evolution group to say is this distinct enough that it should have an, an extra tag you can dispatch in your algorithms. But for now, having the term contiguous iterator helps you talk about this idea much more cleanly. And we use it to define contiguous containers to clean up the guarantee that these three containers really do have a contiguous range of elements, regardless of the allocator that you're using. Another fun piece of uh, vocabulary that came our way was we have these universal generators for sequences of bits in the standard. But the mathematical community that gave them to us, we were calling them universal random number generators. And I was saying, no, no, what really matters is that from bit to bit to bit, you get a random sequence of bits. The fact they happen to group up in packages of bits that are going to be used as a number, it's misleading if you call them that, because you're talking about the groupings being random rather than the sequence of bits. So hopefully using the right name here will lead to less confusion as people start trying to talk about these universal random bit generators, because random sequences are confusing enough for me to begin with. On the memory model side, this is with a lot of the concurrency guarantees. There was a concern that when I'm trying to describe the behavior of an algorithm or some other parts of the standard, although we can have the idea of a lock-free algorithm, we want to guarantee that the algorithm continues to make progress and it doesn't you know, live lock or deadlock. And having the ability to talk about this, uh, the concurrency working group started sitting down to nail down their vocabulary that I'm not the ideal person to talk to about this, but as I said, I'm going to tell you everything that happened in the standard. We now have terms that can better describe how you would document a parallel algorithm to give the guarantees that it continues to make forward progress to eventually complete the operation. So we now have, an, we define the term of an execution step that can make progress. A thread may provide the, con Oh, sorry. Well, you can see the words on the screen. I'm going to run past because this is not my area of expertise. Um, but the interesting thing to note is that atomic operations are not guaranteed to be lock-free. And therefore, if you've got a non-lock-free implementation of the atomic types in the standard library, be aware that your algorithms, even using the lock-free types, sorry, sorry, the atomic types can still block. Hopefully, all the implementations I'm aware of provide the lock-free guarantee on their atomics. But if your, if your hardware doesn't provide the necessary primitives, you might have to implement those using a mutex, and therefore, the ability to the, the chance that that hardware might block is still there. Moving on, what I'm describe as garbage collecting the standard, deprecating and deleting things. First of all, we remove these things in C++11. So if you're using any of these things in your code today, well, as soon as you upgrade your compiler to something that's more modern and conforming, you're going to be aware that you might hit problems. Hopefully, none of these things were in widespread use at the time we removed them. So auto, in a non-deduction context, just to say this is a local variable was removed. Exported templates because there were very, very few shipping implementations and those that shipped didn't get widespread use. Um, the use we had didn't show it to be as useful a feature as we had hoped for. Access declarations, I can't even remember what they were, but they were a, a syntax that you could use to, I think, mark things public and private in a slightly different way than we did back in 98. So that was a pre-98 syntax that hopefully nobody remembered and we quietly removed. One, one of the ones that did catch people out was you could have a non-const char star binding to a string literal, which was really kind of dangerous. So we, that was deprecated in 98 and we finally dropped that in 11. And when we added the new brace initialization, narrowing conversions were banned, and therefore some of these array initializations might have caught people out. Those caught us out quite a bit in our test drives where we were really trying to test some out of bound stuff. Moving on to C14, we removed one function. So not a whole lot of cleanup happened in C14, and this wasn't even deprecated in C11, but by the time we got round to it, C had not only deprecated, they'd removed it, so we went the whole hog and said this, this function was just too dangerous, it went straight away. So moving on to C17, we finally get to remove trigraphs. Which, yes, you can applaud, I'm so happy to see that go. Uh, 
the register keyword, or at least the meaning of the register keyword, was deprecated in C++11 because compilers are doing their own judgment about how to do register allocation. So even if you gave the hint with the keyword, the compilers were largely ignoring it. And this is a really nice keyword to have in our back pocket to use for future language extensions. So we're deprecating, or we're removing the existing use of the register keyword. As I said, that was deprecated in 11 anyway. But we're keeping the keyword. That's still reserved for the language to use at some point in the future. And likewise, back in 98, operator plus plus on bool types was deprecated. And it's just sat around there. We've got some compilers are finally giving deprecation warnings. Having set in deprecated status since 98, it was finally time to remove that as well. Because if we don't clean things out, the standard is just going to accumulate corner cases of interactions indefinitely. You'll notice that bools never had operator minus minus, unless you were using C, where it does something even more interesting. So additional things that we've cleaned up and tidied that might break you in a similar manner to a removal. Um, one of the ones that caught people out by surprise was if I'm using the new brace initialization, it works very well in a lot of places. But when I tried to use it to make a copy, so auto x, y, make me a copy of y, actually it did use an initializer list and surprised a lot of people. It was very confusing. So we're fixing the rules, those rules to say, no, that's what you expect. That gives you a copy. But that does mean if you were genuinely trying to use the auto initialization to, hey, I want an initializer list of ints, um, that code would now be ill formed. And in the really unlucky case where you were trying to deduce an initializer list of a single argument, yeah, we're silently changing the type on you. Hopefully your code will catch that compiling somewhere else. But this is a distinct change that be aware of. We think this is mostly going to be fixing rather than breaking code. Uh, Another part that I'm not sure whether this was as much to ease the specification, but certainly give a clearer model of how the language worked with exception specifications on functions. Exception specifications are now part of the function type, as opposed to some peculiar annotation that sat outside the type system but lived in the grammar. And they interact, the, you know, they decay appropriately the way you would hope, so that you can call the one, the, um, which way around does it go? I always get this wrong when I try and talk about it quickly on the stage. You can call a function that, ha that uh, ha has a wide throwing, it says it, that can throw, you can pass a function, I've got a function pointer for a function that says it can throw anything. Naturally, I can pass a function pointer to there that's got a no except on it, whereas I can't go the other way around and pass a function that can throw through a function pointer that says it can't. That's caught up as a syntax error now. So that's helping find errors in your code. Um, but the compatibility goes the right way, so mostly nothing should break. We've got this wonderful little example that's actually in, a, in the compatibility annex of the standard that says, if I'm doing a deduction, so I've got a template that's going to try to use t to be the same thing. In this case, where I've got the functions have slightly different exception specifications, it would work in 14 and will fail to compile in 17. So exception specifications are in the type system. The old deprecated Dynamic exception specifications do not enter the type system, but we didn't manage quite yet to take them out of the standard. I saw a hand going up at the front here. Okay, so the question is, do you have to, does the signature include the whole expression of the no accept? But no, the no accept expression has to evaluate at compile time to true or false, and it's simply the true false nature is what enters the type system. Um, additional tidying and breakage. Uh, inheriting constructors were a feature we introduced in C++11, and they continue to turn a, turn a small variety of corner cases and bug reports. One of the classic ones was we couldn't actually have a inheriting constructor for a constructor that uses a C-style ellipsis. That just didn't work in the grammar nicely. So we're changing the rules to say, this should work largely the way it worked before, but it will clean up some, some corners and just work better for you. You use the same syntax, as you say, using a colon colon a here, but now what happens is if I call a constructor that's not found in the derived class, it now says, well, I've got, also got constructors in the base class. So I could just directly call that base class constructor and then any members in the further derived class 
just get whatever rules they'd have had if I called, say, a default constructor and hadn't provided members. So things want to default initialize, value initialize, use the default member initializer, however they should initialize, which is essentially with the same behavior you had before, written in subtly different terms. It means we're not declaring new constructor functions, so that initialization has to happen somewhere other than in calling the constructor. So it's a slightly different arrangement of the code, but should be a, a cleaner model that will be easier to understand. And is generally what people wanted when they spoke about inheriting constructors. Also on the removal side, moving over to the library now. Uh, auto pointer has finally gone, deprecated in C++11. Now we have unique pointer, we don't need it. Um, bind first, bind second, memfun, and unary function, all these, the old adaptable function API that relied on having special type defs in your classes. Uh, we've generally got better ways of doing these things now with lambda expressions and bind. So this limited functionality was deprecated in C++11. If you're using those functions and types, they are gone from C++17. Random shuffle was a, a shuffling function that basically used the rand function from the C standard library that was not particularly well specified to be a good random number generator. So that was deprecated in C++14 and we're removing it from 17. Also on the whole garbage collection and cleanup side, back in C++98, when we standardized IO streams, we put in the deprecated annex. Oh, and here's some other names people have used in some of their implementations to describe the same things, but use the ones we put in the standard instead. So we're finally just cleaning up these type defs that nobody I, I've spoken to knows about these things apart from people who read the obscure deprecated annex of the standard. And also going is the support for type erased allocator in standard function. I'm calling this one out because it wasn't even deprecated in 14. But we had many reports that this was a very hard, if not impossible, function to implement, uh, the, 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 this use of allocators. We don't have any shipping implementation that has successfully figured out how to implement it, so removing it isn't going to break any code because anyone relying on it was relying on a broken implementation anyway. This just could not work as written. So by removing the support now, we're hoping that will make it easier to provide a correct implementation of the, the need for this kind of support for allocators in function and similar types at some point in the future. Uh, further cleanup in the library. Um, we're tightening down our specification for the kind of things you can add pass to predicates in the standard library. The general rule was you could pass any functor, which meant you didn't have to const qualify the function call operator, even though everyone knew that was best practice. The standard library, in theory, should have gone out of its way to support this. Turns out not quite all standard libraries were doing that. Um, we think the reason this was never there in the first place was back in 98 when this idiom was first defined. Um, people were still not as familiar with the idea of overloading a function call operator, never mind const qualifying it. This just looked a bit strange, whereas now it's a very familiar idiom. So we're not requiring libraries to do strange things and jump through lots of hoops to support unusual code. And my favorite new clause in the standard library, zombie names. Um, the idea here is I've just told you about all those names that we've taken out of the library. Zombie names is a clause that says all those names remain reserved by the, to the standard library for previous standardization. So standard library vendors can still provide those things as extensions if they want. Those names are reserved to the standard library. You're not allowed to define macros with these names. Now we've taken these things out. So this is our standard clause that says, yeah, we had those names once, they're still ours. And yes, we can still ship these things and support customers who don't want to break straight away. So features deprecated by C++14. The previous standard, uh, random shuffle, that not only did we deprecate it, we removed it in 17, so that's gone, gone. On the language side of deprecation in 17, um, static const data member definitions are being deprecated because we've now added the notion of inline variables. So an inline variable follows a similar kind of rules as an inline function. So typically, think, typical use case is a standard, uh, sorry, the uh, a static member, uh, data member of a class, where um, if we don't, it has to be defined, and it has to be defined at the moment in exactly one translation unit that is messy when you're dealing with templates and. 
we've already gone through these set of rules about how inline functions can appear in multiple translation units, multiple headers, you can see the thing many times, as long as they all have an identical definition and the preceding inline keyword. So we're now doing the same thing with inline variables that just solves this whole corner of strangeness when people are trying to get their static data members initialized correctly. And therefore we deprecated the old way that for the const data members where they could be defined in the class. Still legal, but deprecated because we've hopefully got a superior alternative to move to. On the library side, now that we've removed all that old adaptable function API with bind first, bind second, and so forth, we can at least deprecate the type defs that we had there purely to support that. Uh, the main reason that these things weren't deprecated before was we had not one, not two unary and binary negate functions that we didn't have an alternative to, so that was the tail wagging the dog saying these keep all those type defs around forevermore. So we've introduced a new library function called notfun that's uh, similar to memfun in, in naming idiom, but it solves, it generalizes the problem of the negators and lets us remove these things. So they're deprecated for 17, we expect to remove them as soon as C++20 opens. Uh, uncaught exception is a particularly poorly specified library function that was trying to let you detect if you're in the middle of stack unwinding if an exception's already in flight. Uh, we're replacing it with a better function called uncaught exceptions plural that will give you a count of how many exceptions are in flight. And if you thought that answer couldn't be more than one, I've got news for you and I'm not going to tell you how because it's so much nicer not to have to deal with that. But yes, you can do strange things that can have multiple exceptions in flight, multiple versions of the same exception in flight and uncaught exceptions will give you a, a, an accurate version of that count. We also have the is literal type trait that was not very useful because knowing that a type is literal doesn't give you any useful information. A literal type is a type that's got a few rules about it, trivial uh, destructors and has at least one const x per constructor. But is literal doesn't tell you which constructor that is. So yes, I know that my type can perform const x per initialization, but unless I know which constructor it is, that's not useful information. So it's debatable whether the whole term of a literal type is useful as currently formulated, and certainly the type trait wasn't serving much of a useful purpose. So that's now moving to Annex D with the other deprecated components. We're also deprecating standard iterator. This was the template class that just had a bunch of type defs that would in theory make it easier for you to define your own iterator types. All it provides was five type defs that now rather than being named, you need to know the order you put them into the template instantiation to know what they map to. So if, if anything, it felt like a step backwards. But the whole idea of using base classes to forward type defs doesn't seem to work as well in C++11. We've just got cleaner idioms for solving a lot of these problems. So we're deprecating standard iterator. The library types that were defined in terms of that already were cleaned up their specification in C++14. And the recommendation is just put the type defs into your type directly. Raw storage iterator was an iterator for iterating over raw memory, so the idea is I could initialize, or you know, through the storage iterator, construct my elements into raw memory as I'm going along. Uh, the iterator was, didn't work very well once we got a much better defined allocator model. There's a whole bunch of problems with it, we're deprecating. I'm gonna have to talk faster because I'm running out of time and I'm not gonna get to the library at this rate. Um, get temporary buffer and return temporary buffer. There was, were a cut optimization point that we put into the standard library to say, sometimes if I can spot that I can do an efficient allocation off the top of the stack with information known to the implementation, I can maybe do a really efficient uh, allocation without even having to lock memory and go out to the heap and so forth. And if I can't, I can fail and you can go off and do a slightly more expensive thing, but your, your library can de detect this and say if I can get some cheap memory, sometimes I can do something better. Uh, these APIs, didn't get those optimized implementations. We didn't have the RAI wrappers that you would need to use them safely and idiomatically. So rather than clean them up, try and fix them and make them a, an optimization opportunity, they've not been optimized in 25 years. So the decision here was we'll just deprecate them and if we really need an optimization there, we'll have a, a cleaner, better version at some point in the future. And finally, when we had allocator traits, as the way you perform allocations in all your containers and data structures. There's a whole bunch of things in standard allocator that would be deduced according to the formula of allocator traits. Uh, 
And indeed, you could always access allocators now through the allocator traits interface. So having the deducible parts of standard allocator actually part of the allocator that just do the default thing left a temptation to go off and call them directly. Now clearly, if you've got C++03 code, that's exactly what you're doing. It was the only way to do that. So we can't remove these features yet. But we can deprecate them and say, yeah, the intention is we really want to send the message allocator traits are the way to access your allocators. We've also got a new term we're calling deprecation light. Um, when you start doing atomic operations, we've got this memory order consume. That is, I'm not sure if it's not clearly specified. It's not clearly doing what people want it to do today. But there's a real intent that we should be able to fix this and make it work. So uh, deprecation lighting it. We're putting a note in the standard rather than officially deprecating it, saying, please don't use this yet, but we will make it more usable in the future. So heads up, be very cautious using memory order consume until we fix this, hopefully, in C++20. So, new features. We introduced a bunch of stuff to do with literals in C++11. I have a good audience, so I'm not going to dwell on that slide. In C++14, we introduced digit separators, binary literals, and the library provided the user-defined literals that would therefore actually use the feature. So for C++17, in the world of literals, we added UTF-8 character literals. I'll admit, I'm not sold on the utility of this feature, but it really cleans up how we specify things in the standard. As far as I can tell, a UTF-8 literal must be ASCII, because anything that's above 127 doesn't fit within a single char, and we can't have multi-character UTF-8 literals as we could with a regular char type that promotes it in, because it's actually an error in the language. It will diagnose this as an error. So as far as I can tell, the only thing you can store in the UTF-8 character literal is an ASCII character. But it really cleans up the specification for how you have prefixes and so forth with character and strings. And it's just nice to have the syntax mirror each other. So rather than being a weird exception, it's just not a very useful feature. We also have from C99 hexadecimal floating literals for folks who it's a bit of an obscure corner, but I write test drivers that deal with floating point numbers an awful lot. And being able to really specify that bit pattern rather than rely that the parser is going to read the decimal text in my code, transfer it to the, the binary of the hex values I'm expecting, having a, a way to spe specify that precisely is really handy. Uh, the thing to note, um, we have an OX in front of the uh, floating point number. Then we have the mantissa, and then when you get to the exponent, it's followed by a P, not an E, and that number is decimal, not hex. Thank you, C. But <laughs> that's, the, that's the form of a hexadecimal floating point, and as far as I'm aware, most compilers are already shipping this because they got this from their C implementation. Attributes. C++14 added the deprecated attribute. Uh, C++17 therefore adds full through, which we got from the Clang folks, as a way of saying, here's a case statement case, uh, that we really do want to deliberately fall through to the next one. Please don't give me a warning about it. And it's certainly a very good, clear documentation to the readers of the code that you didn't accidentally miss the break and they don't go and fix your code by adding it. Um, no discard is to say, this function is going to return a result, and you really should not just drop it on the floor and ignore it. So it's an opportunity for the compiler to give you a warning when you don't actually consume the result of calling that function. Good example that we've not done in the library, but we may, who knows if, if we'll have ballot comments suggesting this, the empty function of any container. Somebody who's coming from another language will look at this. This, thinks, this sounds like a command, empty the container. I'll just call empty and we move on. No, empty tells you whether or not it's empty. So why would I, there's no need to call this unless I'm going to examine that result. So that's a good way to catch errors in code. So hopefully that will become a common idiom within standard containers that people will, whether the standard mandates it or not, put no discard on the empty function. And I'm sure you'll find lots of examples of your own. Uh, maybe unused is the attribute we're going to use for something that potentially is not going to be used in the following code. Compilers love to give you warnings about this, especially on function parameters. The usual idiom is that you cast that to void. Uh, so unused was a popular name for this attribute because it's shorter, but we like nice long names in the standard, especially when you've got conditional compilation. That means if, if this thing goes through an assert, it might or might not be used. If you said unused, you would therefore expect the compiler to diagnose if it actually gets used, because that would be surprising. 
So maybe unused was a simple general all-purpose attribute that describes all these situations with the least confusion and most characters. Uh, also on moving on to attributes, we can now put attributes on namespaces, because that's one of the few things that we couldn't actually annotate. So yay, attributes on namespaces. I'm showing an example of a de namespace lots of people would love to deprecate, but we haven't deprecated yet, sorry. Um, another place we can now put attributes that we couldn't before was in uh, enumerators of an enumeration. So if I've got a series of values, maybe I've got an old enumeration that represents flags I don't want to support anymore. I've come up with a cleaner name for something and I'm transitioning. You can actually actively deprecate a specific enumeration or any other attribute that you wish to use, but deprecation is always a, an easy example. But providing normative encouragement to compilers to say, if I see an attribute in using the attribute namespace feature that isn't my, my attribute namespace, don't give a warning about it. We put this feature in so that the feature is extensible to other libraries. Yeah, there's a feature I don't recognize. I'm not using it. But if I nag you about that, the feature then turns into lots of conditional compilation and defeats the whole purpose of introducing the idea of attribute namespaces in the first place. And similarly, there was an idea that if I'm using a lot of attributes from the same attribute namespace, it would be nice to be able to have a using and saying, using this attribute namespace, I'm using all these attributes. So I don't think there'll be widely used features, but when you're dealing with some heavily annotated code, that could actually be very useful. Aggregates get a little tweak up in the new standard. Aggregates can now have empty base classes, which means if you've got a class that was not an aggregate in C++ 14 because it had an empty base class, that class will now follow the aggregate initialization rules rather than calling the, the default constructor and the copy constructor accordingly. Uh, that does show up in a few corner cases, but uh, the, the difference. Typically, uh, I can now actually initialize all those members, but when I'm going through containers, some of the ways I can initialize things get a little bit more confusing. Aggregates, now they can have base classes, are not allowed to have inherited, they're not allowed to inherit constructors or have explicit constructors. Um, how would I have an explicit constructor? I would inherit, oh. I guess I actually couldn't have an explicit constructor while that's in the, some folks in the core wording found a, a, a corner case of how they could actually get explicit on a constructor into an aggregate. I'm not sure how that could have happened. But if, if you miraculously construct it, it's still not allowed. Um, from, and a really handy problem they finally solved. Aggregates now support copy list initialization. So if you're using brace initialization and trying to copy your aggregate, well, the rules of brace initialization say I initialize the first element with the first thing in that list. And gee, I don't have, my first element is not of my own type. I'm not a recursive data structure, so that's not valid. So actually that will now be a copy constructor call rather than trying to initialize the first element with a copy of yourself. Uh, I've got way too many slides on lambdas because lambdas are always fun to talk about. But, uh, this was C++14, and you've already all told me you're familiar with C++14, so I'll not dwell on this. Classic example of I'm trying to do a reverse sort algorithm in this case, so I'm just going to re turn around the two elements of the container that I'm calling. Um, I've got to use this funky, horrible type def name, so it's much easier. Well, A, I'm suggesting that bind would be the answer for this, even though people love to use lambdas because the bind syntax is really short, and it's fairly clear as to what it's doing. I don't have too much other text to read. But C++14, we can do this directly using the polymorphic lambda feature, where we just drop auto in as a type, and we now have a function template that's deducing both arguments for the, um, the implicit functor that's in there. And again, we just call the arguments in the reverse order. The other thing we got from C++14 is lambda capture. So where I can in, use an initialization expression to initialize the captures. Classic example usually given here is I'm calling a sort algorithm. I want to have the lock over that whole algorithm while I'm calling my function. So I'm going to have a lambda. I'm going to move the unique lock into the lambda. So the lambda now owns a lock. And when the algorithm is done, it destroys the lambda and the, uh, the lock goes away. Uh, the main problem with that, of course, is that standard library algorithms can arbitrarily copy uh, 
their functors. I noticed this just as I was preparing these slides, and I've just started a discussion on the standard reflector today, that this is a feature sounds great, but it's not going to work with the standard library. The advice I was given was use a reference wrapper instead, so call stud ref, but holding a reference to something that's supposed to be unique lock sounds particularly worrying to me if it is going to be copied many times, everyone thinking they on the lock, and it adds nothing because all I, I've got to move the lock outside, which I already had covering the context anyway. So the classic example of the, the move initialization of lambdas, I'm not sure how useful a move only lambda is yet, but hopefully we'll pick this up in the library working group and see if there's anything more useful we should be doing there. And that's a holdover from C++ 14, that's not new stuff. Um, what am I doing here? Ah, this is just, um, this is pretty much how you would write it today is you actually, you could lock fine-grained on each operation or you could just, as I say, on the previous slide, lock the original slide, lock over the whole algorithm outside it. But, and just to show how did these things get, we have an example in the standard of just combining lots of things together and saying, here's a really awkward set of corner cases to think about, please don't do this. So, C++14, we have the polymorphic lambda expressions I just showed and the capture initialization. Show of hands earlier said you already know all about these. For C++17, uh, lambda expressions can now be const expr, which means that they'll be literal objects. You can const expr initialize them. Um, the lambda expression itself can be executed as a const expr evaluation. Given the generalized rules for const expr that went into C++14, that's really handy. And one of the other things that was problematic in C++17 was capturing a, co if you capture this, you capture a pointer value. And if I wanted to actually make a copy of an object, specifically this copy with the star this, it, the syntax around that was possible but very convoluted. So we've actually got a, a very simple way of just putting a star this in to capture a copy of the object rather than a reference through the this pointer. And I actually am mildly ahead of where I was going to be. I've spoken myself too fast. This was roughly about my break point. So I'll be a little bit, I can, I can slow down a little bit for the next session. F template features, C++14, we added variable templates. So the idea here is I've got pi, and if I want to have, this is a classic example, pi, I'll have it at various accuracies, different frequency of representation for float, double, long, double. I'd use specializations to have my preferred representation of pi in that resolution rather than just relying on passing the long number and rounding accordingly. Um, one of the awkward cases for 17 that we finally got round to just an irregularity in the C++ grammar was most places in templates, we've got the option of using class or type name, and there seems to be a feeling that type name is more of a C++ y thing than class, so there's been a general idiom that people have moved towards using type name. But when I have a template template parameter, so I've got, trying to have a class template of type X, called X, uh, the grammar didn't support using type name there, it had to be class. So we're changing the one part of the grammar that required class rather than type name. Um, do you see a hand going up? Okay. Uh, another, again, minor feature, just doing lots of cleanup now for 17. We've got the feature of, I'm trying to have a template that's going to, integral constant is the classic example, where I'm going to have a constant, but I've also got to name the type of a constant. I can't, I want to give you one thing that's just the constant value, but I end up having a template parameter with two because I've got to say what the type is as well as the value of the constant, as I can see what type, what, what the type is, it's in the constant. So we've got this new template auto n syntax that as you can see we did use n is both of type int and an int with that value. So. If we were to go back in time, we might have implemented integral constant this way. Um, neat new feature. Last one I have on this slide, um, I put it in purple because when I went to try and give an example of this, I went, oh, let's go back and look at the, the paper that was adopted for this. And I actually, although I have this down on the list of things we've done, I couldn't find a paper trace that said what the feature is. It's possible it's come in through a, a library defect report. It's possible that I've just fooled myself and this one didn't happen. So take this one with a big grain of salt. But there's the idea that when I've got literal types, we can expand the idea of what non-type template parameters to be to allow beyond just integers and pointers here. Um, I particularly wanted to look at that to see what, you know, if I'm using a floating point there, what are the rules for matching nouns and so forth. But because I couldn't find 
the actual paper trail, I'm no longer as convinced as I was when I put the slides together that that made the final cut. I'm gonna have to go back and re-research my notes, I'm afraid. So, One of the big features coming to the template feature facilities of C++17 is if const expert. The idea here is the condition I pass to if const expert is going to be some code that evaluates at compile time as a constant expression. And then which of the two branches of code you have got the if else is actually compiled is chosen. So if I've got an expression that isn't going to compile on the L, um, on the, under the if branch, normally what you'd have to do is you'd have to have partial specializations of class templates or overloads of function templates. And you go to a very indirect idiom just to jump around the fact that I've done the test, I know whether or not this grammar is good to code under here is going to match the name, the lookup rules and be a valid expression. And I've got something else I want to do if it isn't. I want to write that cleanly in one place, like the example here, rather than have an indirect fun indirecting function that goes into an overload set that dispatches accordingly, perhaps with some enable ifs. It was really messy. So this is going to clean up an awful lot of obscure template code that could, could be written much more directly. Fold expressions were a popular request for variadic templates where I've got this parameter pack of things, and you know, I'm, 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 the examples I'm using here, I've got the three kinds of folds in the standard, the left fold, the right fold, and the, um, the binary fold. These terms are great if you're familiar with functional programming. Everything I know about functional programming I learned by reverse engineering from C++ templates, so I don't know the vocabulary, but if you know the vocabulary, these are the terms you're looking for. Otherwise, read the syntax and hopefully become fairly clear what's happening. If I've got a left fold on double ampersand, I'm going to do a conjunction of every expression in the pack expansion and get true or false at the end. It does follow the traditional short circuiting rules when it evaluates all those expressions, but it also has to instantiate all those expressions in the parameter pack before it starts evaluating them. So if you're looking for a short circuit evaluation that says, because I know that the third one was true, I don't need to worry about whether or not the fifth or sixth thing in the pack is going to compile correctly or not because lookup fails. No, you still have to instantiate the whole pack, but it will combine accordingly. Um, another popular feature was requested for a long time and we just didn't quite know how to specify in standard ease. We think we've got it right now, and this came in right on the deadline of C++17, is deducing templates from their constructors. So I've got a class template, and it's got a, a, a template constructor in there. Depending on how I call that constructor, I could be able to deduce the actual parameters for the class itself. So here we've got an example. I'm trying to say I'm going to have a pair. This would be an alternative to actually calling the make pair function. I'm going to initialize it with 42u and hello world as a string. Therefore, just having standard pair and then these things in the, in the curly brackets, it now knows I'm trying to deduce the type for a pair. I find the only constructor that can match, and from that, I can deduce that for pair t and u, t was an unsigned int, and u had to be a string. And for those cases where it's not immediately obvious from the template itself, we, can, we have outside the class a deduction guide that can give the direction. So in this case, I'm going to call the container constructor that takes a pair of iterators. But the iterators are not the type of the container element. They refer to the container element. So when I call that, I know I'm doing a deduction, I'm deducing the iterator type, and the deduction guide says, well, I'm a container whose element type is the value type of the iterator that I can find in iterator traits. And that for lets me deduce that for the container, I've got container of int, because I have a sequence of ints that I'm passing through iterators. And I think this is probably the place I should be calling a pause till the second session.